ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم Last time we did the voluntary prayers which included the tahajjud, the duha, the tahayyat al-masjid, the prayer of the wudu, and finally the taraweeh prayers. The class was longer than usual. This week we will be doing the Jumu'ah prayer. And the Jumu'ah has uh, a few things to discuss inshallah. So we'll be discussing broadly four different, uh, five different things inshallah. The first is the conditions that validate the Friday prayers. Uh, secondly, the conditions that obligate the Friday prayers. Thirdly, the sermon and the sunnahs related to the, ser- the sermon. Then the fourth is some miscellaneous factors, including things that are disliked or makruh, some things that are recommended. And the fifth things are all the recommended actions around the Jumu'ah prayer. So broadly, that's kind of what I'm going to cover and we'll see how far we get to. I think the first uh, subject, the conditions that validate the Friday prayer is probably the longest in terms of the discussion around it. There are only six items to mention, but some of these things have become controversial in our times and it's worthwhile just discussing it and uh, discussing the Jumu'ah prayer in the West. One of the issues is that uh, the person who is ignorant, he knows he's ignorant, and he goes to a alim and he tries to get his questions answered. And the person who has a little bit of knowledge is the most dangerous person. <laughs> because he starts to think that he knows everything, and um, he does not have an, a sense of how the rule is applied, what is the uh, actual soul of the rule. And uh, he gets mixed up in the ahkam that are written by the fuqaha versus what was the intent of the deen. Right? And so that's where some of these things become problematic as a result of that. And whereas a person who learns more and more knowledge, then he realizes uh, the leniency, and he also realizes the, um, the principle behind the rulings. And um, uh, over time, he, he becomes uh, more lenient with the people and more lenient with people's mistakes. And the, the more you learn, the more you realize that certain things that you thought were very strict often have three or four different opinions behind it. And within the madhab, there is two or, two or three opinions. And you'll find that one alim had an opinion and and others disagreed and someone else had an opinion and others disagreed with him. So, when I say some of these things, maybe you have heard of this, maybe you haven't heard of this, but it does require some clarification. So it's important to remember that the dhuhr prayer is four raka'ah and the jumu'ah is two raka'ah. So it's important to know was the Jumu'ah prayer valid or not valid? Because if the Jumu'ah prayer was not valid, then what do you have to do in its stead? You have to pray a Dhuhr prayer. So let's take the example of someone who has gone along a journey and he's traveling with his wife and his kids and it, Jumu'ah time enters and he says, well, we're not in a place where there is Jumu'ah. Let's make a khutbah, I'll be the khatib. He says to the son, you give the adhan. The son gives the adhan, he makes the khutbah, and uh, he leads his wife and his children in a two raka'ah prayer, right? And for him, dhuhr was, was uh, valid and not jumu'ah, right? It's a separate issue that he's a traveler, so a two raka'ah prayer would be valid for him anyway. Um, let's say perhaps you are in a, a town or a city, and you have prayed jumu'ah, and the uh, Jumu'ah was not valid because there were insufficient people or the arkan of the Jumu'ah were not met, 
then the person has to pray dhuhr instead of day, juma that he prayed because that was invalid. So it's worthwhile knowing these things. Also, the pandemic taught us that uh, during the pandemic in, in Auburn, there was multiple Jumas happening, right? Uh, usually we have Juma here, we have it in Bukhari House, Town Hall, and Gallipoli. I believe that's the only places in, in Auburn that I'm aware of. I think the other Musallas, they don't do Juma, and they, those people come to these areas. But during the pandemic, Every uh, person got his relatives together and they were doing Jum'ah or they were doing Eid and people were learning how do I give a khutbah and what are the sunnahs of the khutbah. So these are things that people actually learned in the last two or three years. So now it's worthwhile just revising some of that fiqh and understanding what the principles are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jum'ah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَعِيَ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ This ayah is the only place in the entire Qur'an where Jum'ah and its ahkam are mentioned. Similarly, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentions Ramadan and its ahkam and that's the only place it's mentioned. So even though both Jum'ah and Ramadan are significant sha'air of Islam, they're only mentioned once. Okay? And if you compare it, Allah mentions the word taqwa and that you should have taqwa 200 and something times in the Quran. Okay? He mentions Jannah and Jahannam more than a thousand times. But Jum'ah is once, Ramadan is also once. So all the ahkam come from this ayah. And we'll come to the, the, um, the conditions and those things and how they relate to this area. The first condition is that the place has to be what is termed a Misr. And the Fuqaha have defined that a Misr is a town and not a village. Okay? So in a village, Jum'ah will not be valid. Okay? And in a town, Jum'ah will be valid. So now the question is, what defines a town and what defines a village? So Imam Abu Hanifa has defined a town as a place that has a governor and a judge and a mufti. So straight away your question is, does Sydney have a governor and a judge and a mufti? And the answer is, we have a mufti. Okay, I don't know who appointed the mufti, <laughs> but we don't have a governor and we don't have a... A qadi, right? Because there's no qadi anywhere in, in, in Sydney. In fact, there's no qadi anywhere in the <coughs> West full stop. And then let's now take the example of a large uh, country like India that has 200 million Muslims living there as a minority. They don't have a qadi. They don't have a governor. So is Jumu'ah valid for those people? Right? And the answer is that in the books of fiqh, so, and the reason I am mentioning this is the first time that you hear this, then people will start saying, okay, Jum'ah is not valid in Sydney, therefore I don't have to pray Jum'ah, I can just pray Dhuhr, I can just keep going to my work and life is easy after that, right? I can keep any job. But the reality of the matter is that when you go to the books of fiqh and you look at history as well, all those lands that were Muslim, that got conquered by non-Muslims, they kept on praying Jum'ah. And they kept on saying that Jum'ah is valid even in those times. Now, understand something. That when the Fuqaha defined the town as being a certain size, they said that when a town gets to a certain side, it needs an administrative structure. Okay? Whereas a village doesn't need a structure. It doesn't need a sheriff and a police and, you know, someone to control things, a council, so to speak. Whereas a town, when it gets to a certain size, it needs someone to run its affairs. And then it needs to look at people who are mistreating the law. So it needs a qadi for that. And it needs people to go to a alim, so it needs a mufti. So a certain number of people, when it be, there is a certain number of people in a town, then Jumu'ah becomes valid in that area. The second thing to understand is that if we were to suppose and say that Jumu'ah is not valid in the West, 
then where will all those people learn their religion from? Look at how many people are here. We are 10, 15 people, right? And when it's Juma, we are 800, 1,000 people in this same masjid, right? So the percentage of people that will attend a dars is tiny. And when you made Juma a fard, the number of people that attend that is much more significant. So if we were to say in Sydney that Juma is not valid, they will all stop attending. And then people who, who will stop attending and their knowledge about Islam will decrease to the degree that people will start becoming non-Muslims. So it's actually essential that even where the numbers of Muslims are not a lot, that they continue to pray Juma because of the connection with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second condition is that the Juma'ah must be appointed by the Sultan or his appointee. Okay, so for example, if you are living in a Muslim country and the ruler appoints a Wizarat uh, Ta'aleem or something like that, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, then the Religious Affairs Ministry can appoint the Juma'ah as well. However, again in the West where there is no Sultan, there is no ministry, then the locality of Muslims can select organizers, can select people who run the affairs of the masjid and therefore they select Juma in this fashion. So you find different masajid in Sydney doing things differently. There are certain places that I have been to where you turn up and you decide who is giving the khutbah today <laughs> and someone gives the khutbah. This happens in city musallas and in other places. In other places there is someone designated who is not a alim and he gives a khutbah every week. And in other places there is a alim or there is a mufti who is giving a khutbah every week. And all of those are going to be valid because we don't live in a place where there is a sultan or there is a khilafah. Okay, so the first was a Misr, the second is appointment by the Sultan or his delegate. The third is that the Jumu'ah is in Dhuhr time. Okay, and um, this is for the Hanafis and the Shafis. The Hanbalis and the um, Malikis have a different opinion. But regardless, the key thing here is that. Juma'ah starts when Dhuhr enters and Juma'ah becomes invalid when Asr enters. Okay? So if someone has not prayed Juma'ah and Asr enters, then he becomes sinful for missing Juma'ah and now he has to pray Dhuhr in its stead. Do you understand that? Okay. Before I move on, it's necessary to discuss the Adhan of Jumu'ah because the timing of the Adhan relates to the timing of the Jumu'ah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fas'aw ila dhikrillahi wa dharul bay' two things became obligatory because of this. The first is going towards Jumu'ah and the second is not doing any sale. So then the question is, when does this become obligatory that I have to go towards Jumu'ah and when does it become obligatory that I cannot do any sale? Okay. Imam Abu Hanifa says that when the first Adhan is given, that is when it becomes obligatory to go to the Masjid. So the question is, when is the first Adhan given? The first Adhan is given when Dhuhr time enters. That is when the first adhan is given. Just like how we do in this masjid, they count it by the second, as soon as it enters the time, they give the first adhan. It becomes obligatory to go towards the khutbah. Now, listening to the khutbah is wajib, based on this ayah. And being present for the entire khutbah is also wajib. Okay, because Allah says, Fasa'u ila dhikrillah. And when He used the word ila, then that means that you go to all of the dhikr. And so now the question is, is the dhikr the prayer 
or is it the khutbah? And the fuqaha have said that it is not the prayer, but it is the khutbah. Because in the khutbah, what is the purpose of it? It is a reminder. Do you understand this? So frequently, when I'm working in the hospital, people will say to me, what time do you guys pray Jum'ah? I say, 1.20, we start. He said, no, 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 when do you pray the prayer? I said, we pray around 1.40. I said, okay, I'll come at 1.40. He said, no, 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 come at 1.20. <laughs> and what will happen is that person will always come at 1.40. Why? Because the ignorance is they think that the prayer is fard and I don't have to attend the khutbah. But Allah doesn't say this. What does He say? فَسَعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Now, the problem is that if you are 45 minutes away, right? And the adhan for dhuhr goes at 5 minutes past 1. That means you have to leave at 12.20. That's the latest you can leave. So you have to leave before you hear the adhan because you are 45 minutes away. That's where it becomes obligatory on you to leave so that you can catch all of the khutbah. Right? And the person who comes later for the khutbah is sinful in proportion to the amount of khutbah he misses. So the later you are for the khutbah, the more sinful you are. Do you understand this? Okay. Any questions about that? Straightforward, inshallah. Now, yes? You're more sinful or less ajr? More sinful because you miss, you're missing a wajib. Right? Is it fard or wajib? Um, the, the prayer is fard. Yeah. Right? And the khutbah is wajib. Which in the Hanafi maslak is amal al fard. Shafi, I don't know. I don't know the position there. But if you are to, to look at the wording in the ayah, it is fasa'u ila dhikrillah, which is go towards the remembrance, which is the dhikr of the, the khutbah. When, when the, if you don't get the achir, yes. but the, the fard is, is uh, completed. Yes, the fard is completed, yes. When, when the sin comes, if, if, if it's sinful, if, if you cover the, the fard, Okay, let, let's give you an example just for you to understand the concept, okay? When dhuhr time enters, dhuhr became fard on you. The condition is you are a Muslim, you are an adult, you are sane. The time entered, dhuhr became fard on you. Now that hangs on your head until you pray it. When you prayed it, you completed the faridah. And the reward is multiplied according to how well you did the action. Now, when dhuhr time ended and you didn't pray dhuhr, the sword is still on you. Okay? Asr time has now entered. And you are now praying dhuhr, you got rid of the farida of the sword over your head. Okay? But you don't get rewarded and you are sinful for praying it late. Do you understand this? Because you prayed it out of its time. I mean, if, I cut the jum ah, if you catch the Jum'ah, ah, right? The, there's a hadith, the Prophet wasallam, authentic hadith, that the malaika sit and record the people as they enter the masjid. And the earlier they enter the masjid, the greater the reward. Until the khatib stands up to give the khutbah, they close their books. So Meaning, now, the fuqaha have tried to explain this hadith, okay? And what they explain is, the job of the malaika is to continuously record. They're always recording, right? So the book they close is the book of the people that came before the second adhan. Do you get this? Okay. So if you don't get there, by the time the khatib is, is starting, you lost the ajr of getting there in time. So now, they will keep on recording the people that enter because they have to record everything, right? But those people who are coming later are being sinful for coming after the khatib has started. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. The darajah of the sin is different. We're not talking about a major sin. But because he has left the wajib, it becomes sinful as a result of that. So, the point that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize here is that the person should try and make every effort to be coming to Jum'ah early and at the very latest to be there before the khatib starts. Okay? 
at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes? Uh, if suppose some, some person has totally uh, missed the khutbah yes. and prayed only two rakah with the jama'ah, yes. uh, will that be considered as... We will, we will discuss that as a separate subject, but just to answer your question, okay. that is a valid jumu'ah. The fuqaha have ikhtilaf if a person arrives so late that he only catches the tashahud. What does he make up? Does he make up two rak'ah or does he make up four rak'ah? Okay, and so they have ikhtilaf there. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i say that he makes up two rak'ah. Okay, and Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal says that he makes up four rak'ah. Okay, because he didn't, he, 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 he only got there for the tashahud, so he does not get rewarded for the Jumu'ah and he has to make up a dhuhr prayer. So he has to make Correct. If he came and the Jumu'ah is finished, okay, then he will make up a Dhuhr prayer. Unless in a place like Sydney, where there is another Jumu'ah happening in a close masjid, and he can catch that, then he, he should go there and catch the Jumu'ah there. But we'll come to that, inshallah. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was only one Adhan. Okay? That when the Prophet ﷺ used to get up to the mimbar to give the khutbah, then the Mu'addin would give one Adhan at this stage. This continued until the time of Abu Bakr عنه, and Umar عنه. At the time of Uthman عنه, the population of people in Medina grew such that people started to come late to the khutbah because they were outside of Medina. To this distance they had to go. Who's been to Medina? Who's seen the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Almost everyone, mashallah. The size of the masjid right now is bigger than the entire city of Medina at the time of the Prophet. <laughs> right. And before the ex current uh, the expansion that happened in the 90s, the masjid was very small. They used that was the edge of the city. So that's a very, very small city. But at the time of Uthman the Allah anhu, it started to get bigger. So people started when they started to leave their houses, they would get late to the khutbah. Then Uthman radiallahu anhu instituted another adhan that would be given before the main adhan to tell the people go towards Jumu'ah. Okay? And all of the Sahaba at the time agreed on this. Now, someone who doesn't have ilm will say that this is a bid'ah. Okay? And it meets one of the criteria of a. Bid'ah. But in fact, all the Sahaba saw this as a correct interpretation of the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. And even some of the fuqaha said that if there is a need to give a third adhan, so be it as well. Alright? Because why? If the if the call for the prayer is given, then go for Jumah. Do you understand this? And the purpose of that adhan is to tell that Jumu'ah Khutbah is about to start. So that doesn't have to be a very long gap, okay? It's enough to let the people to come towards the Jumu'ah. Okay, so we did three conditions. The first is Misr, the second is appointment by the Sultan, the third is that it must be doing Dhuhr time. The third is that the Khutbah must be before the prayer, okay? And, um, this is opposite to the Eid prayer, right? What happens in the Eid prayer? After the, the fifth is that there must be general consent. What does this mean? That the masjid must be free and open for anyone to attend Jumu'ah. Automatically, there is a problem in the West now. Okay? There are three types of problems. One is that you are praying Jumu'ah at your workplace and the workplace says that only the employees can come inside. So is there general consent? No. The answer is no. Okay. Second situation or second example, I'll give you a, similar to this first example. You are praying Jumu'ah in a school or the university. And the school or the university says that only the students can attend the grounds. Now, is there general consent to attend Jumu'ah? 
The answer is no. I'll give you a third example, similar example. You are praying Jum'ah in a prison. A lot of Muslims in prison, unfortunately. And they're all getting together and praying Jum'ah together. Is your general consent? The answer is no. Right? I can't go inside the jail and start praying Jum'ah with them. Right? There's a specific criteria who can go in and there's visiting hours and there's limitations on how you can interact with the people. Sorry? Don't give the kuffar in prison. Inshallah, don't worry. Don't worry about that. There's interesting people in prison. <laughs> people who have very uh, interesting ideas. Anyway, that's besides the point. This general consent principle, you need to interpret it in a way that the fuqaha have generally said that there should be a general consent that anyone can attend the Jum'ah. But if there are specific circumstances that mean that other people cannot attend, then Jum'ah still remains valid. I was working in the hospital. Uh, we had the pandemic, which meant that we could have no visitors for many months. So we had the situation where only staff were in the hospital. And before that, we used to have the teachers from the TAIF from across the, the road, they would attend. We would have patients attending in a wheelchair. We would have visitors attending, all kinds of people. But suddenly we were in a situation where Jum'ah, we were now half the numbers and there was no general consent. But because there's a valid reason for it, then the Jum'ah will still be valid. Now, if there's an invalid reason, let's say I uh, run the affairs of the masjid and I suddenly say that everyone from India is my enemy and they are not allowed to attend Jum'ah. Jum'ah becomes invalid for everyone. Okay, And we have sometimes a situation where people have fights in the masjid and then they get an anti-violence order against this and this and this is problematic. If the person is truly violent or criminal, that can be a, you know, a valid reason. But if it's political reasons that you have put an AVO against someone else, this makes the Jum'ah invalid for all the people that are attending. And this has happened in Sydney, and this is an issue. Okay, the last one is that there must be a jama'ah. The fuqaha have defined jama'ah differently. Okay, Imam Abu Hanifa is the most lenient in this matter. He says the minimum number that meets the criteria of a jama'ah is that it is the imam with three male adults. Okay? Imam Shafi is the other end. And he says that there should be 40 people. Okay? 40 people apart from the Imam. Now, every Jum'ah that I pray in the hospital is definitely not 40 people. Okay? So, Imam Shafi, within the Madhab, they do have some leniency that if there is multiple Jum'ahs happening with valid reasons, then that Jum'ah will also be valid if there are considerations. So there are considerations, for example, there may be space considerations, there may be considerations that that's the number of people in that locality that uh, want to pray Jum'ah because they are praying, like we do pray in the West. For example, you, um, you know, went to Dubbo or Orange or something like that. There's not that many Muslims, but you wish to get together so that you can continue the spirit of Jum'ah, then that will be valid. As long as you meet the minimum criteria of the Hanafis, because the Hanafis have the minimum criteria. So all the fuqaha say, if you're going to take some leniency, don't go any further than the Hanafis, right? So you can't have one Imam and two people and say it's a valid Jum'ah. So I remember I was in New Zealand and I traveled to a place I uh, don't know where I went to. I think it might have been Blenheim or Nelson or something like that in the South Island. And I went there and the people said, you, you have a beard, so therefore you must be learned, which is <laughs> not a criteria. But anyway, that's been working for me most, most of my life. So I said, okay, you lead Jum'ah. I said, okay, when is Jum'ah? They said, I said, this time. So I came at that time. The place is entirely empty. I said, okay, I'll wait. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. One person came along. 
So I said, is this normal? He said, yes, this is normal, but we will wait. So another person came, then another person came. Another person said, okay, alhamdulillah, now we can do Jum'ah. And then we, we, we prayed uh, Jum'ah together in that fashion. Um, if there's two adults, male and a female, that will not be sufficient. Okay, why? Because the Jum'ah is fard on a male and not a female. Okay, do you understand this concept? Okay. So that's all the things that validate the Jum'ah prayer. What's the time? Nine. Okay. There are seven conditions that obligate the Friday prayer. So if a person is in a place that meets all of these criteria, and he himself meets the criteria, then the Jum'ah is obligatory on that individual. So it's two separate things. What makes the Jum'ah valid and what makes the Jum'ah obligatory? Okay, the first is the person must be a male. So that means that females are excluded from this. So it is not obligatory on females. If females pray a Jum'ah prayer, is it valid? Do they have to pray Dhuhr instead of it? No. no. Right? So, and we say this every week that many females attend then the Jum'ah is valid for them. The second is that the person must be free. That means it is not obligatory on slaves. They must be a resident in the Misr. means that if a person is a traveler, the Jum'ah is not obligatory. Let's say 7 o'clock on a Friday morning, I decide I'm going to travel to Melbourne. Is that valid for me to do or not to do? Because that way I'm definitely going to miss Juma. I'm, Juma is going to occur on the way. There's no way I'll get to Melbourne before Juma and, ends. Is that valid? Can I do that? Do you have to go to Melbourne? Well, that's a separate question. <laughs> Let's just answer one question. <laughs> Suppose I have to travel to Melbourne. Seven o'clock. Sorry? It's valid. It's valid? So Imam Abu Hanifa says that if the adhan of Jum'ah has been given, then it is makruh to valid to travel after that. Okay? The exception to the rule will be that if a person has to travel with a group, so for example, your flight is at 12.55, and Dhuhr entered at 12 o'clock, you have to leave to catch your flight. All right? Where possible, when you're buying your ticket, don't buy a ticket that way. You know, avoid traveling on Friday if you can. But let's say you had to, you had to get to a tr conference on time, etc., or you had to get to someone's funeral or something like this, then, you know, it, that will be an exception to the rule. But in general, travel starting after the Adhan of Juma is makruh. Imam al-Shafi was more stricter and he said, Fajr prayer. On the day of Juma, a person should not travel if Fajr enters. Okay. The fourth thing is that the person must be of sound health. So if a person is sick and there is haraj in trying to get for Jum'ah, it is no longer obligatory on him. There must be safety in reaching Jum'ah. So let's say that we have an incident where someone does a terrorist attack in this masjid and kills the people. Okay. Now suddenly the people of Auburn are afraid of going to the masjid. And that becomes a valid reason that you don't have to attend Jum'ah until safety returns again. Or for example, someone lives outside of the city and there are bandits on the road from that village to the city. And it is unsafe for him to travel. Jum'ah is not obligatory on that person. Could be issues like this. So where there is haraj, okay, as soon as there's haraj, the obligation is removed. Now, you have to use common sense in this, right? So if you say that my toe is hurting, I don't have to attend Juma anymore, right? Any, if you ask 10 normal people, they will say that that's not a haraj, right? That, that's something you can live with. You can still come to Juma with that. 
right? So if you, if you find that, um, my teacher always says that common sense is not common in common people. But anyway, but if you were asked, to, if, to, if you were to ask 10 people, would they do this? Then that becomes common sense. And if they were not to do it, then it's not common sense, right? <clears throat> Two last things that relate to sound health. One, the eyes must be sound. So a blind person, Jum'ah, is not uh, f- uh, fard on him. And the soundness of one's legs. Okay? So that includes a variety of diseases that if a person is unable to walk for whatever reason, then Jum'ah is no longer fard on him. So let's say today you are healthy. Uh, next week you got into a car crash and your, your leg is fractured and you cannot walk then you're worried, oh, I'm missing Jumai. The reality is that Jumai is no longer fard on you whilst your legs are in this fashion until you recover. If you guys wish, we can stop now and continue the rest next week. Some, are, some of you are looking tired. Continue? Okay. All right. the first one of the... What makes Jumai obligatory? Male. 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 Number one, male. Number two, freedom. Three is a resident. Four is sound health. Five is safety. Six is the soundness of the eyes. Seven is the soundness of the legs. Um, where possible, when someone is traveling and he can catch Jum'ah in a town in his travels, he should catch that. There's also a difference between someone who is a traveler and he is residing in a town during his travel. Let's say you took a flight to Bangalore, right? And you stayed there for three days and then from Bangalore you went to Calcutta and then in Calcutta you stayed for seven days and then you returned back to Sydney. Okay. So if Juma occurred in your travel from here to Bangalore, that's fine. But when you got to Bangalore, if Jum'ah occurred while you were in the three days residing in the town, then Jum'ah is obligatory on you. Similarly, when you went from Bangalore to Calcutta, if Jum'ah happened on the way, it's not obligatory. But if it happened while you were in Calcutta for seven days, it is obligatory while you are there. But isn't he a musafir still? He is a musafir for all that time. But as soon as he becomes a resident, doing Jum'ah in a Misr, then it is obligatory on him. But, but he is not a resident yeah? here. three days in Bangalore. He is not a resident from the perspective of Qasr and Jam'ah. But from the perspective of the Jum'ah being obligatory on him, it is still obligatory. But there are considerations. So for example, someone has come from a long journey and he's jet-lagged and tired and he wants to go to sleep and Juma has just entered. So there are considerations there, right? So the deen doesn't seek to make things overly difficult. But if you are there, let's say you are there for four days, right? Still considered a traveler, right? And Juma has occurred in one of those four days, then you attend it. Okay. Let's carry on anyway. Number three is the sermon and its sunan. I've gathered 18 sunan, okay? And we can go through these quickly, but one or two things I'll I'll mention a bit of time with. So some of these are very easy and you all know them, but it's worthwhile just mentioning them. Um, These are all sunan. And in some cases, these are a rukun for the shafi'is. Okay? So number one is tahara and is required for the Shafi'is. Minimally, the khutbah is two khutbahs. As you all know, the Jum'ah is two khutbahs. And it is something that will be considered dhikr. And the Mu'atamad of the Hanafi Madhab, that the shortest khutbah is the amount of time that it takes to do the tashahud. That is the shortest khutbah. If someone does, that's all he does. The Jum'ah still will be valid. The Jum'ah should not be overly long either. So you go to some Jum'ahs and they are still going one hour later. And this is Khilaf of the Sunnah. Now, 
for example, this class today has been going for 40 minutes. And what I've learned is at, at the 40 minute mark, people start to go to sleep and get to get to tired. Juma definitely finished before 40 minutes, right? Because you, mashallah, you're motivated to come here and learn. And the people that are coming for Juma are not necessarily motivated to, to learn. So it, it's harder to keep their attention. And the principle of any khutbah is an, any class, right? This is, because you are students of knowledge, I'm teaching you this. Don't make it hard on other people, but this is for your own benefit is that it is wajib to listen and be awake and be attentive when you are in a khutbah or any dars or any class, okay? Because that, you know, the deen doesn't want you to come and sit and uh, your mind goes off in other directions. Then there's no point of day dhikr. Similarly, is that when the person is praying, his mind should be on the adhikar he is doing, the recitation he is doing, or what he is listening to, his attention should be there. His attention should not go in other place. Of course it can happen. So in the Jumu'ah, it is disliked to be looking here and there and fidgeting and making circles in the carpet or playing with the stones in the, wherever you are. All those things are khilaf of the, the sunnah. Have we got it? Good. Okay, so number one was tahara, number two was to be clothed. The nakedness of the person should be clothed. The khatib should sit down before the sermon. Okay, so he comes, when he sits down, then the mu'adhin will call out in front of the pulpit. Can I see you? Yeah. Yes, please. On? On or off? I thought, you, are you offering to turn it off? <laughs> Yes. <coughs> so the adhan is called in front of the pulpit. Now that's mentioned because classically the adhan is given in the minaret. Right? I said no. The first adhan of Jumu'ah may be given the, the, the minaret, but the second one should be given in front of the pulpit. So how it's given in this masjid, that's the way it should be done. The fifth is that the khatib should be standing. Now all of these things sound obvious, but one year, uh, one of my uh, persons was sick and I had to be in hospital, in another hospital, not my regular hospital, and I attended Jumu'ah there. So, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. When you give Jumu'ah every week yourself, it's always funny to be sitting in someone else's Jumu'ah. And so, uh, you know, this is a hospital, so it was not a alim giving the khutbah, it's just someone, a regular person. And it so happened that um, the people that regularly give the khutbah, all of them were not available. So this person, he was the organizer, so he gave the khutbah. So he started, and the adhan was given, and then he stayed seated the entire time. He gave one khutbah instead of two, <laughs> and he never stood up, right? And actually, he, he did give two khutbahs. And then he, he led the prayer, alhamdulillah, stand, standing. <laughs> and then afterwards, there was a great confusion. Was the prayer valid or not? Right? And so, uh, you know, the, the sunnah is that the, the khatib should be standing. He should be facing the people. He should start with the hamd. And so you will regularly see that the khatib starts with inna alhamdulillah. Right? And he goes on. He should declare the shahada. And one of the uh, ulama that I like to listen to, Muhammad bin Ali al Shanqiti, when he gives the khutbah, he gets his finger out. Right? And the entire time he's doing dua, he gets his finger out. And it is narrated from the Prophet wasallam. Then when he did dua, he did dua like this. He did it with his hands together. He has also done the dua like this. He has done the dua like this, and he has done the dua like this. With his multiple forms in the way that he has done the dua. So he, whenever he used to give the khutbah, he would always go like this, and, and he would make the dua like this as well. So there's no harm if you're giving the shahada that you go to uh, 
put out the finger for that. But that's not something that, that I found any hadith from the Prophet ﷺ in the khutbah specifically. You should send uh, salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. One verse of the Qur'an should be recited within the khutbah. Okay, this verse should be done in Arabic. Now then, a side branch of this is, can the khutbah be given in another language apart from Arabic? And uh, you're shaking your head, can't be given? Has to be? You always heard it in Arabic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, in Sydney, in just about every masjid, they give Arabic and English. Um, you can't give it. So there is, you know, this is what I talked about in the beginning, right? A little bit of knowledge is dangerous. <laughs> the consideration is given to the people who are in front of you. Consideration is also given to the khatib on whether he knows Arabic or not. So the minimum is that at least one ayah of the Qur'an should be in Arabic because the Qur'an should be in Arabic, right? But the remainder of the khutbah can be in the language of the people who are listening and there is no harm in this even with the Shafi Madhab as well to so the consideration given. It is awla that the khutbah is given in Arabic, right? But there's no point in 800 people gathering and you're talking in a language that they don't understand because they don't get a benefit from that. Yes? So why don't I do that in the haram then, where the, the majority of people are? The haram, the, the haram, now, that is a, a unique situation, right? Because the haram is in Arabia, right? The language of the Arabs is what? Arabic, Arabic you said right? The consideration, for the, people. the consideration now will be given to the people in front of me. I have Tajikis in front of me, I have Uzbeks, I have Chinese, I have Pakistanis, I have Australians. Now, which language will you give? There is no one language that will cover all of those people, right? And so, what they do there as a consideration is that they have the Juma Khutbah going and there is a live translation happening. And so, I've seen many people who are listening to the live translation on the radio as the Juma is happening in the <coughs> Haram. A separate consideration is that you should be listening to the khatib and not listening to the translation. The, the haram is, is obviously has its, its own rules. Is there like, for example, would there be like more than one translation? So then there will be like every language? So that everyone can understand? Yeah. Um, there is no harm in that. There's no harm. So what happens in this, in this masjid is that they do it in Arabic and then they translate that in English. Right? You go to Pakistan or India and they will do the entire khutbah in Arabic. But they will do a very rapid khutbah, so it's barely like two or three minutes. Okay? And what they do before the khutbah is that they do a, a dars, right? That will be long, be like an hour long. Right? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, depending if there's a mufti, if there's a mufti, uh, he will ramble on until everyone has arrived, then he will do, you know, a khutbah that's like two minutes. Uh, they don't consider that dars as being part of the khutbah. That's there as a wa'adha, as a nasiha, as a, as, a, as a remembrance for the people. Uh, but they do the entire khutbah in, in, um, in Arabic. But within the Hanafi textbooks, it is permissible to do the khutbah in the language of the people as long as you are doing one ayah of the Qur'an in Arabic to meet the sunnah. Okay. There should be two sermons as we have mentioned. The sunnah is to advise the people to stay away from disobedience and to remind them about their duties. The khatib should sit momentarily between the two sermons and he does istighfar in this time and the people do istighfar as well. Okay? Like you do every week, alhamdulillah. In the second khutbah, he repeats the hamd and he repeats the blessing on the Prophet ﷺ. He asks for forgiveness in the second khutbah for the believing men and women. Okay? These are all sunnahs. But some of these are arkan in the Shafi'i madhab. Okay? 
So the khatib should take care to do all of these sunnas. Now, when we learn fiqh, right, and I teach you these are farad or wajib or sunnas, do not belittle a sunnah. But you learn these things so that if someone left a sunnah, then you realize, well, was the prayer valid or not? Do we have to repeat the entire thing? If it was a sunnah, then you can say, okay, no, the prayer was valid. It is fine, but it was deficient because he left the sunnah. And the sunnah is something that should be looked after, particularly in these kind of sha'ayr. Because the Jumu'ah is a Eid for us every week, right? And it should be celebrated in that fashion. Okay, we will stop here next week. We will do certain things that are makruh in Jum'ah and we will do the recommended actions around Jum'ah such as the ghusl and all those kinds of things inshallah. Any remaining questions?